Okay, awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us here today. I just was saying, I'm gonna start offering some sporadic better snacks and then you come in person, we'll benefit from that. Anyway, it's my great pleasure to introduce Hamsa Balakrishnan, who is currently at MIT. She's in the, or she is the William E. Leonard Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Uh, she's in the Aero Department there. She got her PhD from Stanford University and Bachelor's in Technology from IIT Madras. Her research is in design and analysis and implementation of control and optimization algorithms for cyber physical infrastructure with an emphasis on air transportation. And that's what she's going to talk about today, particularly for advanced air mobility. And um, I will I will let you to it there. I'm super excited to uh, hear what you have to say. Thank you. It's uh, great to be back. Uh, it was good to see. It's good to see a lot of people again in person today. It's been, I know, uh, at least for me, it's uh, been three years since actually been doing seminars in person. So it's, uh, it's nice to do that. Um, so today I'm going to be talking, as uh, Christy mentioned, about uh, advanced air mobilities. Uh, I think it means different things to different people. I will start with what increasingly is uh, you know, the vision that comes to mind for me when people say advanced air mobility, this is an artist rendition, pretty much. I will show several of these. They all look like something which growing up, I think most of us saw the future vision of, you know, uh, personal air transport with flying cars and uh, in, in cities and all of that. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today is what, you know, the promise of this, why there is a lot of interest again, or this kind of continued interest in this, and also some of the challenges of why we're not quite there yet, and what, you know, uh, the barriers still exist and we need to address, um, especially on the research side. So, you know, the open uh, re research questions here. Um, but more generally, you know, when we do, this is, I, I love giving this talk in aero departments because, like, fundamentally, if we think about this idea of advanced air mobility and autonomous aircraft, that's, in our DNA, right? Like it's a, we, we think that this is something that is new, but it's not. The idea that we want, we design aircraft and we want these vehicles to start doing more and more things on their own is about as old as flight itself. So the picture on the left is the Wright brothers first flight in 1903. Um, the one on the, I guess the right is, uh, um, you know, Lawrence Ferry, uh, the inventor of the autopilot, but 10 years, a decade after uh, the first flight uh, in an air show in France. Uh, so this was pretty cool because he has um, his mechanic basically fly out on the wings so that, you know, it's clear that they're not, he's not holding the controls. And then, you know, look, man, no hands, the aircraft is flying itself. So the idea that at least over short distances, you don't have a pilot doing this control is something that, you know, is more than a hundred years old now. Um, so one question is, is what is different that, we fly longer distances, right? Like, uh, let's say, transatlantic flight that we want to do. This is not a fake headline. This is a real New York Times headline from 1947, right? So if you think about autonomous flight being that there isn't a pilot who's controlling the aircraft, um, a robot piloted plane makes safe crossing of the Atlantic from Newfoundland to Oxfordshire, um, fully automatic takeoff flight landing, no hands on, you know, no, not a human pilot, a mechanical brain, if you think about it, right, 1947. Um, there are lots of, I, I mean, I urge you to go look at this in the New York Times archives. There were civilian observers on board that, including journalists, like people who were willing to do that. And if you thought about why we wanted to do this, well, uh, you know, in the article it says, Air Force officers speculate that they're clearly uh, wartime, you know, uh, military defense applications of these robot planes, but for peaceful purposes, it's going to be Amazon Prime, right? We're going to deliver packages using this. So the idea that we're going to do this is something that is now, you know, 75 years old. Um, so if it's that old, you know, and I think several of us have spent our research careers basically working on this. So the real question is, what is new and what we're trying to do, or is this a solved problem? And the things we've not been able to do are do this in a way that's reliable and it's not a demo. So it's been a demo that has clearly a lot of promise and a lot of interest that we have not been able to get repeatably and reliably into the field. Um, and we cannot do this without shutting down 
the airspace entirely and have one aircraft doing this, one vehicle doing this. And um, clearly for all the applications that we'd like to do, we want to be able to do this while there are other potentially unmanned aircraft in the airspace, uh, while there are other crewed you know, piloted aircraft in the airspace, and we want to do it in a way where each time you're not worried that this is a demo and it's a very controlled environment, you want to actually do this uh, repeatedly and safety, uh, safely. So at the system level, and so that's why I'm going to focus today on the system level problems, because uh, I would argue that, yes, with the advances in technology and everything else, we're still solving a lot of these single vehicle problems, and that's important to solve as well. Uh, but we also need to be doing this at a system level. So that's what I will talk about. Um, so with this, you know, 75 years ago, if you now talk about what do we mean by uh, these advanced air mobility applications, um, there's a couple of things that have happened in, you know, closer to the past decade. Um, people have started talking about this in the context of urban mobility and urban air mobility. Uh, so this is another artist rendition, this time from Airbus where they say, you know, my kind of flyover, future of urban uh, mobility of, you know, nobody wants to sit in traffic, community, commuting to work, maybe we'll do it uh, by air. Um, so certainly the applications are not do this over the Atlantic, it's let's do it in cities. Um, and the second thing that has changed is that the vehicles look quite different. Um, the vehicles are a lot more intelligent in the ways that we think about intelligence now. Uh, in terms of just computing power on board than what that uh, you know modified aircraft had back then. Um, they are not conventional aircraft, which are now, you know, that are fitted with um, some sort of robot brain, but instead these are new aircraft designs. They're mostly electric powered. Uh, they are mostly not necessary, you know, not fixed wing. A lot of them are going to be um, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft because you don't want to be using um, the kind of land or the uh, airstrips that you would need in fixed wing aircraft, they're a lot smaller and they look different as well. Um, the, so that is really one of the big changes. Um, I would say that I, I'm going to use advanced air mobility as opposed to urban air mobility here because it is also increasingly clear that a lot of the applications for this and why we care about this are, it's not necessarily going to be the case where it's an air taxi to commute to work. It is going to be uh, in a city, it's going to be in areas that are hard to reach. So it could be rural areas that are, you know, like drones for inspecting infrastructure, um, deliveries in places that are hard to get to, or, you know, you have disaster response scenarios where you have ground infrastructure that's broken down and you want to be able to do it by air. So really a lot of the applications that you think about are not going to be urban applications. They are, they are going to be, um, you know, anywhere. And so we will use uh, advanced air mobility for these contexts. The, in addition to the type of vehicles, the other big change that we're seeing is really the scale that people expect. Um, as I said, they, these are projections, right? This is what people expect. Um, one example, of, and that, that is uh, Airbus's uh, blueprint. UTM is for these drones, when people talk about, there are different words. So UAM is urban air mobility, AAM is advanced air mobility. From the traffic point of view, people will say UTM for the, U, the unmanned traffic management, you know, the jargon is UTM. Um, the projection is 20,000 flights per hour over Paris by 2035, which is not that far away. Um, point of comparison, there's about 100 flights per hour over Paris today, right? So this is like orders of magnitude that people are expecting here. Um, and even in sheer numbers, the, the, the FAA projection says that uh, these small unmanned systems, these small drones doing things like package delivery and things, they expect, and this was... Three years ago, their projections for this year were, uh, you know, two to three million. We're not quite there because we haven't addressed those challenges, but these are still, the numbers are greater than all the manned uh, commercial or even, you know, manned aircraft we currently have. We have large, greater, far greater numbers. Um, the thing about seeing numbers like this is, of course, there's a lot of interest in terms of investment in this. And, um, with those projections, there has been a lot of investment in uh, from the private sector, prim primarily on, this is VC funding, and I talked to Maran a little bit about this in the morning, 
Um, in the past decade, it has skyrocketed. Um, and if you think about eVTOLs, the um, electric powered vertical takeoff and landing aircraft alone, uh, there was about $5 billion that went into the uh, eVTOL industry in 2021. The thing about this chart that I want to point out, so the dark, the sort of the darkest blue lines, which are the tallest, are investments in drone companies. Um, the next highest ones are investments in passenger drone companies. These are building the aircraft themselves. And then there's some work on counter, you know, investment in counter drone measures. The thing there where you see almost no thing money being spent on is what happens when there's more than one of these aircraft in the sky at the same time, right? Like the traffic management piece. So right now we are spending a lot of, there is a lot of investment in building the vehicles and designing these new vehicles. And we're designing these vehicles because we think there's going to be a lot of demand and there's going to be a lot of need where there's going to be these thousands of aircraft flying around. We're not thinking about how are we going to allow more than one or two aircraft to actually fly around in the same airspace. And so I think this is almost, I mean, I, I would like to say, you know, and there are, uh, I know a lot of people in this room who work on things which will help address that question. But right now we are at a place where um, there's a lot of investment that's gone into building the vehicles. And the only way any of that investment is going to go anywhere is we can actually figure out how we're going to get it into the system. And we haven't figured that out. And we do need to work together to figure that out. So in terms of some of the key challenges that come out of this, right? If we think about the system level again, not the vehicle design level. Um, I'm going to focus on three things and what, what, that I think need to be answered. The first one is what I mentioned earlier, which is these are not numbers that we've dealt with before in terms of scales. Um, so if we have that kind of demand for resources, for airspace resources, we need to think about how do we actually get efficiency at these scales. We cannot do it by blocking off the airspace every time one, an aircraft flies. Um, because that's not going to be efficient and it's just going to mean you can't support uh, tens of thousands of flights um, at, at, at these scales. The, so that's one thing that's certainly different from the way the current aviation system works. Um, the other super fascinating thing, again, from the algorithmic uh, design point of view, is that the competitive landscape has changed now. So we were used to having in aviation a competitive landscape where the FAA in the US would manage, you know, would be the uh, regulator and the overseer of the traffic. You had for you know a few airlines, tens of airlines, which would be their typical airport might have, you know, of the order of ten big airlines, all doing similar things. You know, they were big airlines, small airlines, yes, but they were carrying passengers. They cared about delays similarly. They wanted to fly similar routes, you know, origin destination. It was very clear what it meant in terms of quality of service and what each of them wanted. And um, it was also one of those things where with the central regulator being the government, you could say you have to share the information, otherwise you don't get to fly. Um, but now you have not just these airlines, but you have... Um, you know, you might be doing package delivery, you might have to be doing passenger transport, you might be doing, you know, emergency response, medical delivery, you might be doing a photography mission. And they don't all want to do the same, the same thing. Some of them want to stay in the same region of airspace for hours on end, and other people want to get the shortest path somewhere else. And what it means to, um, you know, one of them might actually have important medication or time sensitive about delivery that they need to do, whereas the other is, this is, you know, a tourist thing and a 15 minute delay is not going to make our two hour delay is not going to make a difference and I'm not going to pay for it. So I think the competitive landscape is very different from the way what we're used to in aviation. The two issues that it brings up when we think about solutions is privacy actually becomes important now because information sharing is not that important, um, is not, the, you know, that obvious and evident that there's uh, people are going to share information. As soon as uh, in the U.S., the FAA required that all drones would have to have an ID and would have to uh, register. You'd have to register a drone and broadcast it. The first complaint is that this is a violation of privacy. Right? Why do you need to know where my vehicle is all the time? So it is not obvious that the participants in this new world are going to actually be willing to share information unless there are incentives to share information and share it in a way where... Uh, it's in their best interest to share that information. The second aspect in terms of this competitive landscape is that fairness now actually becomes uh, even more important where fairness doesn't have to mean the same thing for everybody. In, like, what do we mean by fair? 
And so one of the challenges here has been um, in, um, in uh, Australia, when um, the first mover goes in, you know, Google Wing started having flights, immediately there are concerns about, okay, there's a monopoly. Because if there isn't a way of actually managing traffic from different operators in an airspace, the first person who moves in, moves in, but you know, then you have to decide what happens when somebody else wants to use the airspace. And clearly, I, I mean, if you think about it, I cannot imagine that the FAA is going to say, here is the company, the only company that's going to operate over Seattle and over Boston or over New York. So that we do need to kind of come up with a way in which we can serve users with different priorities. So those are the three challenges and sort of confounding these is a fourth, which is it is actually not clear in the system who the we that's managing the traffic is. So if we think about conventional aviation, we went from the first air traffic controller, his name was Archie League. This is his picture. The picture on the left is a picture of him in St. Louis Airport in 1925, because the moment you have more than one aircraft that's going to take off or land, you need someone at the end of the runway to make sure that they don't run into each other. Uh, and then we've evolved from that to you know more modern FAA towers. Um, but if we think about the advanced air mobility context, and the concept of operations that have been put forth by the FAA and NASA, the first thing it says is that the FAA will not play an active operational role in managing UAM traffic or UTM, you know, or both the drones or the air taxis under nominal conditions. So we're not the ones doing it. So now the question is, okay, so we're going to have this different role. You don't actually have the centralized government agency who's doing that, which means that as the rest of us, the R&D community, we also have to figure out not just how are we going to do it right to address those challenges, but there's actually a role on addressing that. And so that's sort of the piece that I, I want to focus on today, which is there are lots of open questions here. So given this, uh, I'm going to talk very quickly about three different problems and a little you know, sliver of uh, some of the work in each of these. The first is, let us suppose that I am a service provider. So I end up saying I'm going to be a traffic management service provider. How can I actually manage the traffic in my region from the, my area with different fleet operators in a fair and efficient manner? Uh, the second aspect is going to be, if I'm a fleet operator who has different customers who want to do different things, how am I going to manage those, you know, and the fairness and efficiency trade-offs. So you can see how fairness and efficiency are going to be uh, trade-offs that are going to repeat here. And then the third piece is if we truly want efficiency here, I'm going to argue that we need different service providers to actually cooperate. Because, uh, and, we, and we have that to some extent, the seamlessness that we expect in our communication networks where I can call, I have a service provider, I call somebody else who has a different service provider and somehow the packets actually get from my phone to theirs. And we need to have that ability or some version of that in the system as well. And to do that efficiently, you're going to need cooperation. So that's going to be the third piece uh, that I will talk briefly about. So um, for the first piece, um, one of the things that we look at is, if I'm a service provider, how do I navigate these trade-offs between fairness and efficiency while taking considering things like I want something that will scale well with the numbers because I know that the numbers are going to be high. I want something where I can be fair because the competitive landscape requires that. And I also need some limits on information sharing because um, you know, privacy is going to be a concern. Um, the other reason why you actually want limits on information sharing is purely in a lot of these on-demand type applications. If you think about it, people say, I'm going to use a drone much like the ride share application, right? There's demand that pops up, I want to respond to it. You currently in the air transportation aviation context require airlines to fly in the file for flight plans three hours in advance. It's like, you know, if you ask a ride share company what your demand is three hours in advance, um, even if they wanted to share that information with you, they're not going to be able to share that information with you because they don't have that information. So I think that's why we want to come up with ways that are a little bit more uh, distributed algorithms that don't require full centralized information sharing and coordination. So here, what we do is actually go to what we call protocol-based congestion management algorithms, protocols being rules of the road, right? We do this on the streets where we do have rules of the road where we get to a stop sign, you know, we say, okay, right, who has right of way, that kind of thing. 
And so here, if we think about the equivalence um, problem here, when we are designing these protocols, you could, you know, this is like a very crude schematic of a problem where each of these arrows is an aircraft. The tail of the air, uh, arrow is where the aircraft is currently. The head is where it wants to go to in the next time step. And what we need to decide is which vehicles are we going to allow to move and which ones are we going to say, well, you can't quite proceed here. Um, and we want to do this in a way where we can actually prioritize different fairness metrics. And I'll go into some of the different metrics that we will care about here. Um, so there are some cases that are easy, right? Like this aircraft wants to go into this other region where there's no one else there. Yeah, sure, there's no congestion. Go ahead, you can do it. Um, there are cases where we have these cycles, like this green loop that we have here. And these cycles are interesting because no one can move unless everybody moves. Right, like if I, the only way this aircraft here can move uh, to this uh, cell is going to be if the aircraft that's currently there moves out and so on. So they, they have to all move. So you can have that kind of cycle. And then you have this case where um, these bigger chunks here, where if you think about who do I prioritize in some uh, cell, like this cell out here, I actually should look at the downstream effects because making that decision on who, which aircraft proceeds not only impacts that aircraft, but it impacts every aircraft behind it. And so in that prioritization, we'll have to consider a broader set of effects. And that's really what we use to guide our protocol, which is there are three cases that we need to deal with, the ones which are easy, you can we can resolve easily, but the two cases that we'll have to really worry about are going to be the cycles and the downstream effects. And we're going to come up with ways of handling both of those. Um, so the protocol that we've come up with basically looks at formalizing what I said earlier. First thing you do is identify and prioritize the cycles because in, the, in a cycle, either everybody moves or nobody moves. So the first thing you do here, for example, when you have this green cycle, you're gonna to have to deal with everybody in the cycle moving. And then these two aircraft are not gonna be allowed to move because in order for them to move, you can't move into a cycle because the cycle is already full. So that helps us um, address those uh, loops themselves. And then for these, things where, you know, like the yellow cell here, we use the notion of the prioritization where we use the notion of uh, back pressure. And back pressure is a standard notion, a well-known studied notion from queuing theory. But the idea is that it's a measure of essentially how many people are behind you in line. And so we're going to look at basically the longest queue of aircraft and say, which sector or which cell has the biggest pressure behind it? and prioritize re releasing the pressure on that, right? Like move the one because it's gonna have the most, uh, the most downstream effects where you're gonna help the most people behind you. And then if you, once you find that sector, if you have to figure out who moves in that sector, we can look at different fairness-based prioritization schemes to decide, okay, we've decided that this is the sector which has the most back pressure, we're gonna relieve pressure there. Now let's figure out who's gonna move into that sector to relieve pressure. And that's where the prioritization schemes come in. And it is not obvious in any of these systems what the most obvious prioritization is because fairness actually plays a role there. And so these are just some of the different things we can think of. So one is you prioritize based on, you know, again, look at the most pressure, the highest back pressure, the longest queue and let, let them go. You could look at the highest recruit delay, namely each of these, uh, those things in the queue is an aircraft and they've already been delayed somebody uh, somewhere else earlier and they've had congestion. You can look at who's had the most accrued delay already and say, well, you should prioritize them because they felt pain already. And so you're trying to minimize that. Um, maybe, you, and th that's something that's pretty done in other aviation context. Maybe you don't want swaps and orders in your schedule. And so you could look at, uh, um, you know, the number of reversals. Or um, actually, uh, yeah. the dominant resource fair or fraction is an idea from cloud computing resources, where you basically look at who, you know, what is the airspace that that person is using, right? So in one case, you could have an operator who is putting all of their flights in the most congested region, and another one who's actually got a diffused set. And you don't want to say, oh, just because you want all the you know, you already have a high external cost. Why should you get priority just because you're already, you know, badly scheduled? So you might want to actually uh, balance out in that way as well. Um, and the nice thing about our protocols is that we can show that any of these fairness schemes actually can be introduced uh, into that and incorporated into it. 
And the solution that you get is, even though this is a distributed scheme where you're making these decisions only based on your neighbors, it is actually equivalent to the one-step optimal. So if you had a, a full global oracle view of what's going on and you optimized it, you would still get the same uh, solution on who would move uh, as you would from this distributed method. Um, so what this ends up being, and but the bottom line really is that nothing comes for free, right? There's going to be a trade-off with fairness. And that, that actually depends, the trade-off depends on what measure of fairness we are prioritizing and we care about. So this is just, um, you know, the kind of things that we can do. We can balance, by picking the right measure of delay, we can balance, make sure that all operators have equal levels of delay and balance that. We can look at only the externality imposed by an operator, the excess delay and balance that, or make sure that the excess delay is proportional to your expected delay um, and so on. And in each of these will have a different implication on the system optimal mm -hmm. efficiency um, of the system. And then we do this through looking at, uh, this is work with collaboration with Airbus. So that's a package delivery scenario in Toulouse where we look at, okay, if you have these hub and spoke package delivery networks, how do you navigate these trade-offs in these different situations? And more recently, we've actually extended these protocols to cost aware protocols, meaning, meaning delay is not the only thing you care about, Maybe the value that or the cost of the, that aircraft is different for different operators. And what you want to do is then build a market mechanism, a pricing scheme on this to actually help with the prioritization. And we show that you can actually extend the protocols to do that as well. So this is a very quick uh, uh, overview of if I'm an operator, uh, if I'm a service provider who's managing traffic and I have all of these different operators in my airspace, how do I look at a uh, trade-off between fairness and efficiency and try to get both to some extent, right? Like um, uh, in, in these cases in a principled manner. Um, the other point of view, but that's only one piece from a service provider, a single service provider who is managing this traffic. And this is quite similar to what, um, you know, the FAA or some uh, agency or regulatory agency decided they were going to manage the traffic. The second piece where this, uh, the same question comes up is from the point of view of a fleet operator. And I'm gonna spend a little less time here, and, but just show this through an example. Um, so the example that we look at here is a shared mobility platform. And I'm gonna look at this in the context of drones uh, because, you know, air mobility. Uh, we have examples on right share as well. Let's suppose that we have a platform of drones. So I'm a fleet operator who manages five drones and I have five customers who want to do things with my fleet of drones. So the five tasks that we have, they're all aerial sensing tasks. There's someone who wants to sense traffic, right? Look at uh, Boston, like Seattle, I guess, traffic is uh, our favorite topic of conversation. So you, know, you want a way of actually monitoring traffic and responding to traffic in real time. Um, we also have parking shortages, so you want to be monitoring parking lots for parking. Um, one of the things with flying drones, especially beyond line of sight, is you actually need good cellular throughput. So while you're flying, you want to be mapping out cellular connectivity in your region. So iPerf is basically a program that's pinging and checking for cellular throughput. Um, you want to be using these drones for someone who wants to do, use these drones for air quality sensing, where there might be a region where you have some measurement that's uncertain and you want to revisit that region and gather new measurements. And then because we get snow, you have a roof infrastructure where you want to um, in, uh, you know, inspect the roof from the using your drone. These tasks are spread over the city. So this is Cambridge, Massachusetts. Let's say that this point is the recharge point. And you know, they're they're all all of the air quality sensing you want to do. This is Boston, this is the Cambridge side. This is the Boston side. So there's a bunch of air quality sensing you want to do out here. There's a bunch of roof infrastructure and parking infrastructure you want to do. And the cellular throughput is sort of evenly divided where you want to map this. Now, the question is, how do we multiplex? Because we could do dedicated drones, where all I'm doing is have one drone send it and it's doing just traffic monitoring or just parking. But the task requests may not be coming at the same time and they may not be at the same cadence. So it's not the most efficient use of my drone resources for me to be dedicating these drones. And I'll show an example of that. Um, dedicating the drones to the different applications will be a fair way of keeping all my customers happy, right? Like 
each of each customer gets a drone and they get to use it only for their task. But then it's not the most efficient way because I could be during the idle time of one of the tasks, I could be using the drone to do something else. And so for us, the problem that we ask is how do we navigate the uh, the, the the same efficiency fairness trade off in these shared multi uh, mobility platforms. And so for us, Mobius is the um, solution that we work on where it's an online platform. And the idea here, I, you know, we have this paper from, I guess, a couple of years ago now. Um, the idea for us basically is we have throughput and fairness, and we will try to trade off short term fairness. So we will prioritize efficiency in the short term, but in order to do that, we will catch up in the longer term. So in the longer term, we will try to get both throughput and fairness, but in the short term, we might sacrifice fairness for efficiency. Um, the fairness metrics that we use, we um, I'll focus a little bit on maximum fairness, but then we've shown that we can actually extend this technique to any uh, alpha fair uh, utility function. And the nice thing about it is like the lot of the optimization piece itself here, we actually just translated to a VRP a vehicle routing problem. So um, there's been beautiful advances in solving VRPs very efficiently. And so what we're doing is we're leveraging that. So everything around that that we're building to navigate this, we're also using the fact that we can solve various versions of VRP uh, very well with uh, standard. And we use OR tools for it in our work. Um, so the kind of, you know, I said I was just going to use an example. Let's suppose that traffic we want to monitor continuously, the parking we want to come back and revisit every 10 minutes, the uh, cellular throughput we want to cyclically monitor, the air quality you just want to go there once and then come back and you're done, and similarly the roof you want to go there once and come back done. Um, what we can show is that if you compare um, Mobius, our method, and maximum fairness, you actually get a solution that's fairly, you get the throughput that's fairly similar to the maximum throughput case, but you get it with much more fairness by not starving certain applications that you can actually get fairness or not. And then the dedicated drone case, basically, it's very fair because everybody gets the same amount, but then the roof application, for example, it only the task on shows up late, which means that drone is sitting doing nothing. So you're losing a lot in terms of the throughput in order to by just sending that drone away to do something else. So uh, a lot of this has been that same navigation of efficiency and fairness, but doing it in the context of if you're there as a fleet operator. Um, the example that I will not talk about here, but with uh, air taxi type of applications comes up with again is we can show that this exact problem relates can be related to the issue of you know destination discrimination and ride share where if you're looking at different regions where there's demand coming up where you want to have tra trips to different regions there are certain regions that are so far away that nobody wants to go so you know it's really hard to find ride shares to certain regions because if you wait in downtown manhattan long enough you're going to get another ride in 30 seconds. So why are you ever going to send somebody as a ride share driver? Why are you going to send someone out where they're going to have to come back? And what we can show is that using this method with, you know, like a 10%, you can be within 10% of the maximum throughput you would get. And at the same time, actually serve much more equitably your uh, different destinations. And the idea is the same, except the customers are going to be destinations, the re regions that you want to serve and the vehicles are going to be cars instead of uh, drones. Although, you know, in the air taxi application, there would still be cars. But um, the idea is exactly the same, where you actually have these cases where fairness and efficiency, if you do not, if you look at a purely efficient solution, it's going to be very unfair. But if you actually come up with a way of navigating the trade-off, you can get to a reasonable level of fairness and get to close to your efficiency. And so that's what we try to deal with here. So um, that's sort of the two pieces here. Uh, the third piece that I think is much more recent work that we will be uh, presenting at the uh, FAA Europe Control Air Traffic Management Seminar in June is um, how do we incentivize cooperation among different service providers? And we're excited about this because uh, this is very different from anything their transportation system has run into before because we've always had the FAA or some other agency as a service provider. And now it's like, we're not gonna have the service provider. So we look at this, okay, we think about the system designer. 
we're going to we go through the con ops, right? The concept of operations that are published and say, okay, what does this mean for the person who's providing the service? And this very complicated picture is what the FAA NASA concept of operations on what the system is going to look like is going to be. In the middle of this, and this, this is for urban air mobility, there's a similar one for on a, you know, the smaller drones as well. And in the middle of this, there is, on the left here, this is where the FAA sits, right? It's where, with all of the current traffic and conventional aviation. Out here, they have this network of private service providers, and these service providers are going to have to figure out how to coordinate and talk to each other and share information as they need it and everything else and you know, send what is needed to the FAA. And they're also going to coordinate with the UAS service suppliers. So I'm going to, in the rest of this talk, sort of group both of these, because both these groups are providing traffic management services to unmanned vehicles, whether they're the smaller drones or their passenger urban air mobility. So I'm just going to call them service providers, because it sort of makes sense for us to think about them as one you don't want two different solutions. You want one solution that talks to each other. Um, the, so we're going to focus on them, and we're going to focus on them, the ones that are providing traffic management services. The reason is the concept of operations say things like weather alerts on what the winds are going to be. That's also going to be a private service provider who's providing that information. But we, you know, the competition there they are complementary services, right? Like someone who's providing weather services is not really going to be competing with someone who's providing traffic management services. So I think it's cleaner, it's easier to figure out how they would work together. Whereas it's not clear to us how two traffic management service providers will work together. So we're going to focus purely on what happens when they're both providing the same services and they're providing traffic management services. Question for yes. you. So how is this being thought of in terms of integrating with the FAA services, because I think is that's a separate thing too, right? Because I mean, you're still going to have like the large airlines. Yes, and currently. that's this left one out here okay. says FAA industry data exchange protocol. And it basically says, when we need to know when it's an airspace that we care about, you let us know. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> All right, Lord of the Flies. Flies. Yes. So, uh, I, and yes, so it is basically, y'all figure it out. Okay, so there's other parts of this too, where like, you know, the airline pilots are sharing like weather information as they're flying, because there's a bunch of things you can't get. Yep. And that's all being done verbally. Yes. Between the planes right yes. now. And so I had a... a clearly not within your current map, and I'm not saying... I'm no, but, and, and, and there is a whole question. And really at some level, we should be thinking about all of the information exchange being somewhat agnostic to whether yeah. it is... A, I said it should be agnostic to whether it's carrying a passenger in an urban air mobility context or it's a drone, but really also you want it to be integrating into the same system because right. uh, at some level they're going to become the same airspace. Yeah. Uh, but uh, um, there it's going to get murkier because the traffic management, one of them is being provided by the FAA and the other is not. Um, so fun times. Right. Hey, but it's a great time to be in research in this field. What can I say? <laughs> it's all open problems. Uh, so if we think about what is actually expected of these service providers, um, and these are just extracts from the concept of operations. So what is known is they're going to be a federated set, federated being each of them manages their own traffic and they're going to have to share information. So there's not going to be any centralized control uh, of possibly private. And at this point, almost certainly private uh, actors over a distributed network um, of these service providers. Um, they've gone one step further and said there can be multiple service providers in the same geographical area because clearly you don't want to give the monopoly over downtown Seattle to one service provider. Um, and we've also said that the same entities, namely the same company, can be both the aircraft operator and the service provider. And um, we've been through this in the internet context where if you actually have your, uh, you know, the net neutrality issue comes up when your content provider is the same person as the person who is communicating, who's uh, something, you know, in charge of the communication because in a competitive environment, the first thing I'm gonna to try to do is to throttle my competition's uh, traffic. And so um, we are, you know, so there's, uh, you know, that's gonna be a challenge here as well. Um, the two pieces in gray, namely strategic deconfliction, is going to be done by the service providers, and that 
The service providers could support if they wanted the C and avoid piece, but that's really going to be done by the aircraft operators. I've grayed out because this is really on the vehicle level autonomy, right? If I see a vehicle, I need to avoid it. And the strategic congestion management piece is the piece that I talked about in the first part of the stock. So we know how that would happen. So I'm going to focus on the for the first three pieces of this where you know we really have no clue on how this is going to work. Um, so to sort of explain this, this is a notional illustration of everything that can happen now. Um, we have federated proper, possibly private service providers. So I have, let's say, these different regions of airspace. Airspace one has only one service provider, right? Like the service provider three who's sitting here and then there's a bunch of aircraft that are operating there. Uh, airspace two has only one, well, airspace two has three possible service providers, but they need to interact. And two of these, the blue service provider and the red service provider also have their own aircraft that they are managing in that region. Um, service provider, you know, airspace three has only one service provider, but then has their own flights and some other flights and competitors flights. And then you could have an airspace where uh, you only have this competition where they're integrating. And you sort of need to find ways in which all of this is going to work in an efficient and we're going to be incentivized to cooperate. And so that's really going to be the cases. Um, I'm going to focus, our work so far has focused on the piece of these could be private and uh, federated. How do we get them to cooperate? We're not going to assume that they're actually sharing the same region of airspace or that they could also be aircraft operators. And I, But I do think that those are the big questions that we need to address in these. What, yes. What are the possible mechanisms that we can? For coordination? Yeah. Um, so I will look at that. So we're going to look at, can we come up with the profit sharing mechanisms with incentives to incentivize cooperation, right? So that's the exact idea. So the question is, where do we come from? We're going to look at profit sharing mechanisms. And the reason is that we actually have a place where we've done this, right? Like I said, telecommunications, we do this. The internet does have this idea of federated autonomous systems. And so we're going to try to see what's common, what's different, and what can we borrow from here. Um, so in the internet, if you think about it, there are these uh, many, what they call autonomous systems, but they're literally, the system is called an autonomous system. Um, internet service providers are one type of autonomous system. If you think about how these uh, ISPs coordinate with each other, there are two main modes. Um, one of them is uh, um, transit, and transit actually require, involves, I'm sending packets, I'm an ISP, I'm sending packets to another ISP, and we have some financial arrangement between us, and we're going to try to, I, I think that's the model that we're going to try to look at here. Um, the other is largely, that's actually the minority currently in the US and the internet. Most of it is through peering relationships. And these peering relationships, the sender keeps the revenue. And the agreements are entirely through confidential bilateral agreements. So, you know, two ISPs have an agreement on what they're going to do. There is no money flow. We just have an agreement. They work well when the symmetric traffic flow. Because if ISP1 needs ISP2 as much as ISP2 needs ISP1 for their traffic, then everybody behaves reasonably well. And so it works well when you have symmetry, which we're not likely to have here. Right? Because if you think about things like hub and spoke operations and things like that, you have very asymmetric things where all the traffic is going in one direction and then somebody is doing four different things and is not going to come back the same way. So uh, the symmetry is not something you get immediately. One of the downsides of the sort of peering relationships is because the sender keeps the revenue, the routes can be inefficient in that there's hot potato routing where if I'm not getting paid based on how much it's going to cost me to efficiently route traffic, I'm just going to get it out of my system as fast as possible. So essentially, I'm going to look at the closest boundary and push, right? get out. And that's very inefficient. And we want to avoid that. And so we're going to try to see if we can avoid, come up with a profit sharing mechanism that avoids hot potato routing. And of course, because these are sector secretive agreements, uh, there's potential for peering disputes. So in around uh, 2005, you know, Cogent and L3 had a falling out, and Level 3 had a falling out, which cut out basically 15% of the internet for about three days. Right, like essentially, you know, well, there are agreements that if we have a disagreement, things are gonna break up. But the internet architecture evolved over time. 
So the reason why it's there is people sort of, you know, the, the urban it and then you evolve from something existing. For us, the beauty of, and so when uh, we're gonna look at the Shapley value and some of the ideas proposed by Ma and Michelle Mishra um, in, um, you know, for the internet context, but the challenge there has been, it's very hard when you already have a setup to change something and move to a new agreement mechanism. Whereas for us, I mean, we're excited about the AM context because it's an opportunity, nothing exists. There's a mode where people are saying, figure it out. So I think there's an opportunity for uh, design here, a clean slate design, which is quite unprecedented because there are very few infrastructures where you now say, you know, you have this new form of traffic, figure out how the traffic management is going to work. So, so that's why, you know, we're excited about this because there's a lot of open questions, but also there aren't preformed setups. So we can propose things that, um, you know, can avoid some of the issues like net neutrality where, you know, and, and that's the thing we want to do. Um, so the Shapley value is an economic concept. And I, uh, you know, the idea here is it was proposed by Lloyd Shapley uh, in 1951 as a, a fair way. So if you have a group of agents, uh, a coalition to uh, and the cooperative game and there's a payoff from it, how do we actually divide this among us? And the basic idea was that each agent will receive a payment in proportion to their marginal contribution. And like much of, many of these economic mechanisms, the way this uh, the Shapley value is arrived at is trying to come up with a set of axioms or, or desired properties you want out of the mechanism. And the properties that we that uh, the, were wanted here were firstly symmetry, namely if there are two agents that are in any group of agents in any coalition are having exactly the same contribution, you want to make sure that they're getting paid the same amount. They're interchangeable. Uh, the second is that. If you're a dummy player, namely nothing is being contributed uh, to, the system, to the system, then you should be receiving no payments. And additivity, namely if something happens on one day and something independent happens on the other day, we should be able to decompose this and say the payments are what happened in the first day plus the second day. And so uh, it turns out that uh, Lloyd Shapley showed that the Shapley value is the unique division of the payoff that will satisfy these axioms. Um, so that's actually quite nice. Uh, I want to leave some time for high level questions, so I'm not going to go through uh, this in a whole lot of detail. But um, essentially, in order to compute the Shapley value, because we care about the marginal contribution in every coalition, what you need to do is say, OK, if this was the group of agents, if these were the service providers who were present, what would the contribution have been? What would the payoff have been? And, and look at all possible combinations and then use that to determine what the payoff for each of these uh, agencies, uh, each of these service providers or agents are going to be. Um, I want to show what the implications are in the routing context, because that's what we care about. Um, so what you can show in the routing context is that service providers will actually, if you say, we're going to look at the profits that we get and then split the profits using the in proportion to the Shapley value, that it will it incentivizes good routing decisions. Good routing being, I'm not going to do hot potato routing. I'm actually going to try to support the optimal route because if I'm a service provider who supports the optimal route, I get more money. I get a better share of the profit. And the same thing is true of all my competitors. And so we're all actually going to cooperate, incentivize to cooperate to get to as close to the, chapter, the optimal route as possible because we're all doing better. And if any of us, by going hot potato routing, I actually hurt myself because if I supported the efficient route, I'd actually gotten paid more. And so it incentivizes that. It also incentivizes interconnection where um, I'm not going to say I want to keep the traffic in my region for as long as possible because I'm going to get paid more. I'm going to say I'm going to hand it off to the person who is most likely to be able to give that aircraft the most efficient route again because it's going to uh, incentivize sharing. And so in a way, it actually promotes cooperative congestion management, which is what we want from the system perspective to come up with a way that we can share this to do that. Um, so we um, run this in some set of you know specific cases where we have an airspace let's say you know we have four regions each of which each of these boxes is being managed by a service provider uh, we have vertiports within these and then we're going to look at different ways in which you can route across um, we're going to say that 
If you have, you're only going to have a route if you actually have a positive profit. So in a sense, if there's a negative profit where your revenue, we are going to assume that the revenue is twice its length. So to some extent, I'm never going to fly a route which is support a route which is more than twice the nominal shortest path route because at that point I'm going to say it's not worth it. I have a negative profit, so we're not going to allow it. Uh, and then we're going to compute the Shapley value, and then we're going to actually look at for different routes um, what the value of the profits are, and what we're going to find is that between optimal routes and hot potato routing you actually get the highest profits. Everybody is going to get the highest profits when they are, when you're dividing the profits using the Shapley value, right? So that's what we want to show. Um, so the kind of demand scenarios we're going to look at, if you have these four boxes, um, you can look at uh, the random scenario where each of these boxes, the service provider sends the same number of flights to all the others, right? So that, that's almost a symmetric model where everybody is doing the same thing to the others. Uh, we have these skewed traffics where service provider one, who's on the top left here, is actually is sending traffic to only the fourth one, which is who's in the bottom right. And service provider two has all their traffic, but they're all uh, internal uh, there. And service provider three has no border ports there and is only supporting transit traffic. Um, a third case where service provider one is the only one is sending out traffic to all of the three evenly. And then one where, in fact, service provider three is this massive, the whole of the airspace down there is a single service provider. And uh, so th there's some asymmetry in that break. Um, but the thing to look at is in each of these cases, we're looking at each of, for each pro service provider, how much money are they making? What is the profit that they're getting under the optimal route versus other like hot potato routing, right? The blue versus the red, uh, and the distance traveled in the second chart between the optimal route and the hot potato route. And we see that for every service provider in all of these scenarios, you actually get more. It is you know you make more money, you get greater profits if you actually support the optimal route, right? Than a hot potato route. So in some way. You're, you have this, if you can find that global solution, everybody's incentivized to actually support that global solution by this form of profit share, um, which is what we expected when we came up with the mechanisms. So it's good to see that it actually works the way we planned it. And, and they're traveling less distance. And they're traveling less distance, which is what you want to support. You want them to support that optimal route. Which, yes, absolutely. Thank you. They're traveling and, less distance. Uh, destinations or where are they randomized they're sort of they're in a uh, few side they're on a grid they're randomized but they're on a grid inside those boxes so um there's some they, yeah it's not but it's fairly the idea is more the concept of it there's a bigger question on how do you actually compute effectively that optimal solution which goes back to some of the things i talked about in the first piece but what this says is that if, if you can come up with an optimal solution in a distributed way, everybody's incentivized to support it, right? So there are slightly two different things here on, um, we're at least not incentivized to take a shortcut if you knew that there was a better route. So the main things here in terms of what we know is that this form of profit sharing actually does incentivize uh, cooperation um, and helps, uh, you know, it's in everybody's best interest to cooperate to, um, alleviate congestion. Um, but there are things that we need to think about when we're thinking about this. First is, um, you know, this sort of assumes that there's truthfulness in their cost, because you look at the profits and their profit being a difference between the revenue and the cost. Um, when it's mm -hmm. things like length or proportional to length, it's easy because everybody can see what has been flown. But then if you think about actual costs, of providing the services, they might differ. And so it's not, you have to think about uh, how, how does that work? Um, much of this, you know, we could have done not profit sharing, but revenue sharing instead. Um, it turns out that a lot of the properties that I talked about don't hold if you do revenue sharing. So we do need to do profit sharing. Um, third is the definition. We came up with those axioms and the Shapley value essentially says, these are the axioms of what's fair and then comes up with the mechanism. But we already knew from the first part of my talk that, you know, that's there's no universal definition of fairness. So you have to think about, well, how does this work if there are different uh, notions of fairness? Um, the other is the allocation of service providers to geographical regions, because I assume that each of those boxes was one service provider. But 
if one of them has a lot of traffic and the other has very little traffic, you know, someone has to decide who gets to operate in that region and not the other. And so that is another, you know, possible market design question that needs to be addressed or algorithmic question. Uh, and then there is a question of who gets to participate in the coalition, because here, ultimately, if there is a path that, you know, for Boston traffic, it could, an aircraft could potentially fly out all the way to Seattle and go back to Boston, should the service provider in Seattle be getting a cut of the profits because there's a path? And so one of the things we do there when I say we assume that you're not going to fly more than twice the length is restricting who can participate here. But um, that is a call, right? Like how much are we going to allow the free riders to participate here? And so I think uh, that definition of spatial locality is the third thing. And then there's, of course, the computational tractability because you've got to look at all possible combinations of these coalitions. And so uh, you know, there are problems on how do you do this at, at scale as well. So, um, so sort of to close the loop on that, I think some of the open questions that we have, uh, that we haven't addressed are the second two pieces, because I focused on what do you do if you have these federated, possibly private service providers. But if you have, um, and in that case, there's some interaction with what happens within that region. If you have multiple service providers in the same geographical area, it is not actually clear how that works. Um, who has control? I mean, as anybody, you know, a lot of us work on controls, it's clear that someone needs to have authority. And it's not actually clear what the rules will look like if you actually don't have a single person in charge who's in that. Uh, and then, but at the same time, it's clear that if you have a large enough space, nobody's going to say all of Seattle goes to one provider, right? Like uh, that's there too. And then, the case where a service provider could be an aircraft operator, you have to deal with net neutrality type of uh, effects. Currently, what's going on is that because you need to have a traffic management system to, uh, to fly your aircraft, almost every, the only service providers who potentially are thinking about traffic management are the aircraft operators themselves. So the line wants to operate more than you know, a thousand of aircraft they have built a traffic management system, right? Walmart with grown up is doing their own thing. At some point, they're going to operate, want to operate in the same airspace. And we do not have, we don't know how that's going to work, but we will definitely be in that piece where every traffic management solution actually belongs to an aircraft operator. And um, we know that in a competitive environment, that's not going to work. And it's not clear how that's going to get resolved. Um, so I want to wrap up with this, which is coming soon to a neighborhood near you. And I like this because, you know, uh, this was, uh, I mentioned that we'd grown up in Walmart, this was two years ago. And one of the things that they were thinking of was the multiplexing problem that I had talked about in the second thing, which is the cost of delivery is going to get offset by using the vehicles for other drone related services like insurance inspections and emergency response and construction oversight, because it's clear that to have a, sustainable business model here, you need to be doing multiple things. And so that's a very much a, an issue. Um, we've been working, we started a collaboration with JAXA recently, and NASA has been working with JAXA as well to use drones for search and rescue. And a lot of this is where do you plan your bases and what do you do? And we have a paper that'll be at the ATM seminar looking at some of that with uh, colleagues at JAXA. And then, you know, as I mentioned, Zipline, this is, uh, I guess now a little more than a month ago, but again, you know, uh, aerial delivery. So it's certainly that these deployments are becoming more and more. Um, we've gotten to a point where a single company can operate, you know, hundreds of vehicles. Uh, I think the problems that still remain are how do we do this at scale with multiple companies doing this. Um, so I wanted to end where I started, you know, started early on, namely, there are a lot of traffic management challenges and um, there are really things where you need R&D and really there are, these are research questions because there aren't existing solutions and we know that there's a problem and we don't have a way forward. So uh, it's an exciting time to be in the space. Uh, and um, I wanted to end with, uh, I'll answer questions, but also to thank my many, many collaborators, some of whom, you know, with the three pieces, but you'll see the same faces showing up in multiple places because people work on multiple things here. Uh, as well, but uh, you know, I'm happy to like uh, answer any questions and discuss anything. Thank you. Questions.
Um, we have a two part question from yes. online. So um, Meng Wan asked um, that the AAM algorithm is applied to a 2D space, yet the error space will be 3D. So how do we deal with that? Yes. And then related to that, um, specifically, Presia Caraway says, specifically in the TOL ascent and descent mm -hmm. across the glide path of multiple aircraft ceiling and floors. Yeah. Actually, if you don't know, Presia, she actually worked for Walmart. Yeah, our program just you know. Oh yeah. So those are uh, both really uh, good questions. I think um, we the abstraction is a two D thing, but really the way we think about it, they're cells that connect to each other. So um, uh, to some extent, we it's more a connectivity of where you can go to from one place to the other. So it's a um, yeah, it's a two D projection. But the way to think about it is just it's a region, and it could be in three dimension. But we care about. Um, who your neighbors are, which is where you want to go to next. And that could actually involve changes as well. Um, I think the takeoff landing area question is uh, super fascinating, super uh, important. And I don't have, uh, apart from some work on, there's going to be a lot of congestion, a lot of issues there. Um, we haven't dealt a whole lot with that except in the context of some of the algorithms that we have where we look at um, the constraints there tend to be more rate-based and not occupation-based, occupation, cell occupation-based. So it's not so much that you can only have one or two aircraft in that region, but it's that you're doing 10 aircraft an hour or 20 aircraft an hour. And so the way you uh, way we address it in those algorithms is when you're doing the optimization, the constraints end up being on the rate, assuming that you have some way of keeping the separation with that rate. And it's not a super satisfying answer, but uh, it's also not one that, one that we've said is super challenging and we've not fully addressed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I was, uh, this is more, maybe a quick, uh, quick vision question. So in the market, uh, uh, in this allocation I think we talked about, uh, is that, is the, um, Kind of is the collision also includes that if I want to participate uh, in this space or just like in terms of the value of this? Like, for example, if there's like two service providers, do they have to worry? Like, if there's like four, I said, like, do they have to worry about if mm -hmm. these two will go go along here? You know, give one. Or you mean like, will they form, uh, co collude? Yeah. And then they will they collude off. and break off like the core of, you know, yeah, like one has to it's mostly the value. Yeah. We have not considered the, uh, uh, so I think the way we've thought about it right now is if I was not going to participate, I would not even be part of this profit sharing mechanism, right? Um, but certainly when you think about coalitions, you have to think about uh, collusion between two service providers who then say, we're going to take, we take the ball and go home, right? This is our airspace and we walk away. Yes. Um, but in that case, I think what will translate to is you won't be at all a part of this mechanism. Got it. And in this right. mechanism, is fixing the old participants. Yes. This is yeah. the route, like, we're like, this, this, okay, got it. We're, we're fixing this. Um, I think there is, that is actually a, sort of a really good question, right? Like, let's suppose that I am a large service provider who's also an aircraft operator. And I am operating largely in the downtown Seattle area. And I say, I'm not going to take anybody else's traffic. If I have a monopoly, can the, is there a mechanism? Should regulation step in and say, you cannot do that? So there are a lot of these things where, you know, it is, it, there has to be a role of the solution is going to be a regulatory solution. Right, and the example in the aviation context will be, um, you know, when deregulation happened, there were smaller airports, there's smaller markets where an airline will not make any money serving, like no airline will serve it because there's no money. And at that point, you actually need a regulatory agency to say that in order to operate everywhere else, you're required to have some service into smaller markets, right? And that solution cannot be a market-based solution. Right. That solution might have to be a regulatory solution which says you cannot take your airspace and your friend's airspace and walk off, right? Like, yeah. uh, but I think, yes, so some of these things there has to, and I think what we're trying to explore here is trying to understand what is it, what are the limits of things we can do with incentives 
and what are the things that we're going to need regulation to address. And I think there are a whole bunch of things which are going to require regulation to address because um, financial incentive, they're, they're literally, I mean, with the internet too, there are regions which don't have good internet connectivity because there is no sustainable business model to provide connectivity there. Yeah. Uh, you want to uh, so great presentation. Thank you so much. I just had a kind of high level question. Uh, when you break it down into service providers, you know, we have it kind of federated. Uh, why not even break it even further to every drone becomes its own, like, you know, node uh, and basically like has a sphere and that input that, you know, algorithm that you put in, why couldn't it just be in that drone? Uh, and then the drone knows it has to go from point A to point B. That interacts, you know, that sphere kind of interacts with the other drones. It's like, okay, I have like a you know, heart transplant, so that's a very high priority. Uh, I've been on flying for that many minutes, so I have like battery priority, and then it can kind of just automatically, very quickly make that decision. It's like, oh, you get priority, and then just kind of automate the whole system. Why do you need the service provider? Oh, that's a really good question. So, we do actually, I mean, in these implemented the picture I showed was very much the cells are there's only one aircraft in each of those cells. So it is almost as if the drone is its own thing at that level. Um, the trade-off that you have is going to be one of long-term efficiency. Um, the idea being that if I, so logically speaking, if I have a slightly larger region of airspace, I can actually look at prioritizing over a longer distance. And so, you know, I'm not always doing this one-step myopic optimization. So the trade-off is going to be between Distribute like the extreme level of distribution, just like, you know, if you had a full biopic view of knowing the whole day and doing the optimization, I'm going to get huge levels of efficiency, but I'm not going to necessarily get the fairness that I want um, or the autonomy that each agent wants. Um, I think this is, it, it'll exactly be the same. So the example that I used is actually pretty close to what you said, where we're, each drone is what we're doing. But what we envision is that really there would be these longer regions where larger regions where the service provider would do some level of optimization and these protocols will be at the interface between two service providers. But yes, you're in the extreme case, it'll be where we are talking about. What are the issues and, and remedies associated with an aircraft, uh, a drone or whatever that drops off the network, either because of a communication failure or maybe it's got a bad, you know, maybe it's a bad, it, it maybe it has a nefarious intent. Um, we deal, yes, this is entirely assuming everybody is cooperative, uh, all of this. Um, there are, there is work on looking at contingency planning and what do you do if you drop things off. We have other work on looking at more multi, like mile based approaches to navigation where we look at uh, slightly more, you know, everybody's not cooperating with everybody else, and we're um, not necessarily adversarial, but false, right? Like the communication dropouts, that kind of thing. Um, this assumes that the service provider actually knows and has the ability to communicate with everybody else. Um, but you're right. I mean, one question is how much of the airspace? So, what is that protocol for shutting the airspace, some region down because the drone is not responding? Um, I think given that a lot of these drones are commercial off the shelf drones, um, that has become an issue right now where it's not, you know, when they used to be entirely only the Air Force had drones were doing, the security levels of the onboard software was certainly at a higher level than things which are hobby drones. So we are getting to a point where there, there's a question there. Uh, we do not deal with the adversarial environments here, but I think there is an entire body of research on what happens there. Yeah, I get the drone police. Yeah. So uh, what do we, can we do all of our question oh, and then oh, go ahead? Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> um, okay. In, in your earlier slides, you had a, a, a bullet that said that you consider drones lasting 15 minutes better. I didn't see where that came into play. Ah. And I think that's a pretty big deal with current feasibility of all this as so, a usefulness of the system. Right. So for us, the drones lasting, where that comes in is when we're doing the routing and everything else, we need to make sure that they're back to their base mm -hmm. by then, right? So 
Uh, it doesn't have to be 15 minutes. It can be an hour. It can be 10 minutes. But currently, most of these things that we have that are off the top have 15, 20 minutes battery life. So that drives mm -hmm. the... Um, it has to drive the routes that you come up with. So where that goes in is when we come up with a, the vehicle routing problem on a route, we need to make sure that you're not actually flying for more than 15 minutes and you're back to base to recharge. So it's an input that we use. It can be anything else, but we have to be very mindful of the fact that uh, these have some limited battery life. Yeah. Okay. And every room could have different battery lives. Yes, yeah, we are assuming the same thing, but you know, you in principle you can have different things, but to come up with a plan, you need to know what that is. Okay, so that's I think that is the stronger assumption that we know, that we know what it is. Do you see allocation of uh, altitude as a parameter that people would start using, like you know, spectrum? Yeah, I, like, when I say allocating airspace, I actually mean that in three D. Right, which so is why I'm saying zones. it's that you know there's some volume of airspace that we are going to allocate to a service provider, mm -hmm. and the service provider can decide how they're going to allocate it within flights. There's no reason why it has to be within one region. I think when you look at only vertical sections, um, the question about you know takeoff and landing areas becomes. An interesting one where yes, you can allocate all you like in that dimension, but at some point everybody's coming down. Yeah. So you know who gets to control that and how we control that becomes an issue. But yeah, we're sort of agnostic. Like we're thinking about volumes of airspace that need to be allocated. We're not looking at uh, what their shapes are. But if they're small, they create an elevator and yeah. you know. Yeah, you need to get up there. <laughs> you're, you're, all you're doing is you're saying that there are some spaces that are going to be easy. Yeah. And then you have to deal with the interactions in the spaces where more than others come down. The same thing with you know space flight, right? With launches, like once they're at some level or you know very high altitude flight, yeah. you don't actually care after a certain level. But as long as they have to go through the space where everybody else is, you actually do care. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking extra time to answer. Thank questions. you. Thank you.